Great. Hello, and welcome to Green Burials, The Greenest Way to Go, presented by Jackson County Library Services. I'm Carrie Turney Ross, Adult Services Coordinator. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. This program is being recorded. If you do not want to appear in the recording, please keep your video turned off. And um, we ask that you keep your microphone muted while the presenter is talking. You can turn on your mic during the Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So right now, uh, our summer reading program is in full swing and you can participate by um, coming to our website. I'm gonna go up here to menu, explore, summer reading. Our theme, readers are leaders, encouraging everyone to be a leader in their community and uh, family, school, workplace, wherever it is that you um, feel your community is. Uh, reading makes you a better leader. And so we're encouraging people to find ways to be leaders um, in their community. To participate, you can, uh, you can go to this page and click get started and that will take you to our JCLS Beanstack site. You can log the books that you read, programs you attend and more. And at the end of the summer, you'll be eligible for one of the grand prize drawings. I also wanna make sure everyone knows how to use our new catalog. Um, we switched to a new format a few months ago. And so uh, there are these sections up here that are you know, hot topics that people would uh, want to read about or, or possibly explore. You can search using the search bar up here. Uh, one cool thing, you can also search in lists. So I've created a list for this program. If you just click there to do in list and search green burials, you'll find this further learning opportunity. Um, there are books and DVDs about green burials as well as other funeral, funeral rites around the world. I will stop my sharing now and I'm gonna share that link in the chat. All right. Uh, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Our presenter today is Marianne Perry. She's the sexton at the Oregon, um, at Oregon's first and only oh. dedicated natural burial. I gotta turn the sound on somehow here. There you go. I, I went ahead and muted you, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the Forest Conservation Burial Ground at Willow Whit Ranch. Uh, Marianne Perry is also a certified home funeral guide and has been educating the community on after death care, home funerals, and green burials for over five years. Thank you for joining us today, Marianne, and I will hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I really appreciate our Jackson County Library system and uh, your support, Carrie, in offering this um, to the community with me. So thank you. And um, yeah, support the libraries. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about Green Burial, kind of the science and the, the background, and, um, and then about my place of work where I'm the sexton at the Forest Conservation Burial Ground, which is located um, just outside of Ashland on the backside of Grizzly Peak at Willow Witt Ranch. Um, I just want to first applaud you for being here, being willing to, to be curious about, I assume you're here because you're exploring your own uh, after death care plans for yourself or for someone that you care about, and that's a big deal. So uh, thanks for doing it and for making time and space in your life for this. And I also uh, just want to acknowledge that talking about our own uh, mortality and death in general can bring up lots of things for different people. So I hope that you're uh, taking good care of yourselves as you um, explore this topic and, and reach out to whoever it is that you reach out to for support around that. 
The ranch that I'll be sharing about um, a little bit later, along with um, the part of the valley that I live in here in Ashland, is the ancestral homelands of the Lotgawa, Tequilma, Shasta, and Athapaskan people who were forcibly removed in the 1850s, as many of you know. And the ranch owners of Willowit Ranch have worked with Native communities to learn about their land and to make their land accessible to the community. And maybe you have been up there before, some of you. It's a, it's a place that's open to the public um, every day of the year. So I am going to uh, share my screen now with you. And I'm happy for you to, um, you know, as you guys know, when I'm sharing the screen, I can't see all of you at the same time, but if you have a, a question or comment or, you know, something to add, um, if you could just write that right into the chat, that's the best way for me to see that. And I will, um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay being interrupted kind of midway. And also um, we'll definitely have time at the end for questions. So green burials, the greenest way to go. And also, you know, I think the most uh, common way to go in, in our history as people on the planet. Um, it's not really until the last hundred and, you know, 100, 150 years that there was another way to go, <laughs> really. Um, of course, there have been uh, cremation and funeral pyres and things like that for, um, you know, thousands of years as well. But the whole funeral as an industry and the ideas and practice of embalming and sealing caskets and putting ourselves in vaults and things like that is relatively new for, um, for humans to be doing. And so while we're talking about, you know, what green burial is and the details of it, it's, it's not something new. I didn't invent it and no one that we know invented it. Um, it's really the way that we've been taking care of our dead um, for, you know, for many, many years. So um, we, we do like to acknowledge both the, the Muslim and Jewish practices of green burial. They've never done burial any other way. And so, um, that's a, a something that has really, you know, traditions that have can carried on the, the practice and, and legacy of natural ways of caring for our loved ones. These are all photos of the forest conservation burial ground. And um, you can see that we, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but this is just um, some sites of some grave sites there and a daughter laying her mom to rest and then a, a grave um, once it's been closed on the right hand side there. So green burial is really just interment in the earth in a way that doesn't do anything to inhibit decomposition. In fact, the intention is that decomposition is gonna happen. And so really being there on the land, seeing the soil around us, seeing the, the grave, seeing the casket or shrouded body lowered into the grave are all acknowledgements that decomposition is not only, you know, going to happen, but it's what we uh, want to happen. Um, you know, many people say, I want to be a tree. Um, I was just joking with Carrie. We don't have many people say, you know, I want to be grass, um, but it's all of that. Um, you know, we become whatever the living material around us is, and it's really um, you know, the intention. And so when we look at the criteria of what makes a green burial, green burial, it's non-toxic preparation of the body. Um, so that really means no embalming. And um, there are some green, there's one, there are a couple different types of um, green embalming fluid that, um, you know, people can choose, not usually necessary, um, but then also everything that is buried you know, the, the body, the clothing, the shroud or container are all biodegradable. A lot of people at this point always ask, but what about my hip? <laughs> you know, they have, what about my knee? Um, so we're going to leave all of those wonderful, helpful parts in you, uh, in your body. Um, you know, we're not too worried about metals. Um, really it's, it's, toxic chemicals and plastics really that we don't wanna be burying. Um, and then of course, no vault or grave liner. And so those are often concrete, sometimes metal, plastic, um, but to be a green burial would be no embalming, no vault or liner, 
and everything that's buried is biodegradable. So this is underneath the flowers in that grave is a shrouded body. Um, and this was the, our first burial at the forest um, just over a year ago. So in green burial, um, the, the depth of the burial is an important part. We, we've been hearing six feet under for all of our lives, which um, is not always a reality, um, even in conventional burial grounds. Um, in a lot of places, they're hitting a lot of water well before they get to six feet or bedrock or whatever. Um, so we do want you know, the body to be within that, the, the most active area of the soil. So the most moisture, the most aerobic activity, again, because the intention is decomposition. And so we want that to be happening where there's the most um, mushroom, you know, activity and all those good things that um, are what turn us into the trees and the grass. And that shallow burial also makes it possible to use land that might not otherwise be usable um, for you know, conventional burials if, they, if people do need to go you know, six feet under. In some places they definitely do that, um, you know, probably in a lot of places actually. But if, if we do have shallower earth, either where we're hitting water or we're hitting uh, bedrock, it still is accessible for green burial. One is that, you know, in, in green burial, um, even if someone is using a rigid container, some kind of casket, um, they just don't tend to be as large as some of the shiny metal or hardwood um, caskets that um, are part of conventional burial, which necessitates a larger, deeper grave. And then that, that um, hummus and the pH and you know, all of the magic that soil is really takes care of our bodies in terms of any toxicities that we're putting into the earth ourselves. Um, so you know, we're not neutral ourselves, but the soil definitely takes care of, um, of itself and takes care of our bodies. There isn't any reports of um, soil contamination or water contamination um, outside of green burial grounds. We do have a setback of being a hundred feet away from any um, waterway or you know pond or lake or anything like that. And also no, um, we, there isn't any evidence of you know animals disturbing bodies even though there are these relatively shallow graves. So there's that, no soil or water contamination and no animal disturbances. So we, um, you know, the, the Green Burial Council um, is a national certifying organization for green burial grounds, for funeral homes, and also for green burial products. And they say, you know, 18 inches of soil on top of a shrouded body or casketed body is enough of a smell barrier that wildlife aren't going to um, create any disturbance. Um, so why, you know, why green burial? I mean, I think that, you know, when, when people think about their end of life plans, there's a desire for our end of life and our after death care to reflect who we were as living people on the planet. And if, you know, taking care of the earth and um, being resource conscious and things like that are important to you throughout your life, then there's a good chance that you want that to carry through um, in how your body is cared for after death. So green burial is a way to conserve natural resources. Um, a lot of green burial grounds are also places where, especially if they're certified with the Green Burial Council, then there's an inherent commitment as part of that certification to take care of the land. Um, and that doesn't always just mean leaving it be. It's, you know, conservation is definitely different than preservation. And up at, you know, the forest, we, the, the landowners have been there for you know 36 years and there is an active management of that forest of as climate is changing as you know it's a fire adapted ecosystem that hasn't seen fire in 150 years so there is a thinning of the forest that happens um so conserving natural resources is, you know and green burial really go well together um and then of course protecting worker health and so 
this goes from, you know, care of the body after death, like embalming, you know, is obviously a, a toxic process. And so the people, the embalmers who are exposed to that as a regular part of their job, they do have a higher incidence of the occurrence of cancers, um, just from, you know, the exposure to that formaldehyde. And there isn't, you know, any research that I'm aware of, or that the Green Burial Council has put out there um, of the impacts of formaldehyde on the environment from the body itself. Apparently it's, those chemicals are able to be, you know, um, they're, they're benign, I guess, um, in terms of soil and water from what I've um, understood, but they're the workers themselves who are doing the embalming. And then, you know, people who take care of the burial grounds. I mean, if we're asking our conventional cemetery groundskeepers to be spreading pesticides and herbicides and um, that kind of thing to keep the grass looking pristine and green and all of those things, um, you know, then there's an impact on our whole communities from that, of course. And then protecting habitat, you know, it's setting aside land. Once land is designated as a cemetery or burial ground, it, it has to, you know, at least in our neck of the woods, has to stay that. Um, it can't then be developed into something else. That's definitely Oregon law. And so it, it keeps that land as in a natural state um, in perpetuity is the, the intention. Um, people often talk about kind of cost comparison of green burial and conventional lawn cemetery burial. And like anything where there are services involved and we can pay money, the, the cost varies widely. Um, so this is um, on the left hand side in the blue. This is a, a study that was done um, through Ever Plans that was put together by a woman named Lee Webster through the Green Burial Council, um, just looking at conventional burial, you know, cemeteries, their statistics. So that range from 4,100 to, you know, $11,600. If any of you have ever planned a funeral and seen price lists, you very well know that it can get much more expensive than that. Um, and because the, the, neither of these are including the arrangements with the funeral home for their services of preparing a body, um, the, the casket or shroud, you know, whatever those additional costs are, filing of paperwork and all of that. And then um, these, are, these are our actual prices from the forest conservation burial ground um, in comparison there. And there are other options within what we offer as well. And I can talk more about that um, more towards the end. But it's something to, something to think about. Um, I love this graphic on the right because I think that it does a really good job of capturing um, what I think is unique about natural or green burial. Um, you know, usually when we think about conventional cemeteries, it's a place that we go, you know, maybe to maybe to walk around, at least here in my community, you know, people walk around the cemeteries because there are paths around them. But, you know, it's usually a place if you're going to visit a grave, it's, you know, sort of a, a reverent experience or a, you know, an honoring at special markers for your family or for holidays. And, you know, a, a lot of the natural burial grounds are a little more um, inclusive, I think, of the fuller spectrum of what's happening in our lives. And so they're often places of recreation. They're often associated with um, farms or other agriculture land. And then also um, they, a lot of them have an educational component. And so I'll speak specifically about the forest. The forest conservation burial ground is on the land of Willow Whit Ranch, which has been a working ranch for, um, well, really since like the 1860s with cattle. And the landowners that have been there for over 30 years now have been restoring the wetlands and meadows and now have an organic farm. They um, have goats and goat milk and uh, raise chickens and, um, and it's also a place, an event place where people are doing all kinds of life affirming activities like weddings and family reunions and family campouts, um, all within the context of, you know, there's a burial ground, there's a farm, there's camping. This is all happening within the same place. Um, and as now that we've been in operation for a little over a year, we're really starting to see the intersection of these events. Like we're having a burial, but the kids are coming up on the school bus for summer camp the same morning. And 
you know, someone is, uh, you know, in the campground with their family. So it's all, all really happening. And this is true for a lot of other burial grounds as well. Um, the Crest at Willowit is our educational nonprofit. So the ranch is also a designated outdoor school site for the state of Oregon. If you remember a couple of years ago, we all, many of us voted um, for outdoor school to be um, a consistent part of the curriculum for fifth or sixth graders in our state for all fifth and sixth graders. And so we get a lot of students that come up throughout the year um, to learn about the forests and the meadows and the wetlands and the farm. And then of course the burial ground itself. So, you know, when we look at conventional cemeteries, I know that this is what I'm, you know, more used to seeing than a forest. This is what I grew up with and where a lot of my loved ones are buried in this uh, type of environment. And um, yeah, so when we look at these grassy areas, I mean, it's pretty easy to see, you know, what it takes to maintain this type of cemetery. So, you know, probably lots of water, maybe fertilizers and pesticides, a lot of maintenance, um, you know, a lot of, of course, mowing and weed whacking to keep it looking, you know, beautiful like this. Um, and a lot of these, um, you know, conventional lawn cemeteries actually require vaults. And that becomes more of a maintenance reason than it is um, for protecting the body from uh, decomposing. So the vaults help maintain the nice level surface on the top of that grass. And we've all seen those riding mowers, um, you know, that, you know, blaze through these areas, you know, just for speed of maintenance. And so having even terrain is, um, you know, a convenience. So that's why you'll, you'll find in a lot of conventional cemeteries that a vault is required. And, you know, after, you know, even caskets, no matter what kind of casket it is, you know, they're going to give way at some point and the vaults are going to give way at some point. And I, I talk pretty regularly with our sexton at the city of Ashland cemeteries. And he talks about, you know, he can sort of gauge based on when a burial happened, you know, about when the when the casket is gonna give way or when the vault is gonna give way. So he's finding, you know, people that were buried 70 years ago, now the vaults are giving way. And then you'll have um, subsidence, of course, of that land. And then they fill it in with soil and grass. So it's sort of delaying the, the fact that the earth is, um, you know, not gonna stay flat like that forever. So resource intensive to maintain a lawn cemetery and um, yeah, and you know, a lot of maintenance. And this is what we're, you know, when you are paying for um, the perpetual care of a cemetery as part of your purchase, that's really what that is covering, you know, the ongoing maintenance and tending of grass, really. So then, you know, a lot, especially with Jessica Mitford's work of, you know, writing about the funeral industry, um, if anyone's read any of her work, cremation has become more and more and more and more and more popular. The, the funeral, small funeral home here in Ashland, you know, they said about 90% of the folks that they, um, um, you know, arrange disposition for are choosing cremation. And we're at, at you know, just over 50% as a nation and way higher, of course, on the coast and especially on the West Coast. Um, but cremation is not without environmental impact. And you know, quite a quite a bit of fuel is used in the process of cremation, and of course, the the emitting of um, heavy metals and other toxins. And this information, I'll show you a graphic on the next slide that um, this is embedded in. This was put out by the Green Burial Council um, just within the last couple of years, so it is pretty current um, information. And I'll switch to that so that you can see that. And I'll just give you, I know that this is small, so you might have to um, look closely. And this is probably on the Green Burial Council's website as well. But this is just, you know, within a year, um, how much we are really mostly putting into the earth in terms of resources and how much embalming fluid we're putting, you know, out into well, you know, that people are processing embalmers themselves and then that we're putting out into the world. So a whole lot of wood, a whole lot of concrete, um, paving that sidewalk to the moon 28 times, 
uh, a year. And so, yeah, resource intensive, which I'm sure is not a, a surprise to you, but a lot of folks are, are somewhat surprised to hear about the impacts of cremation, you know, that it's a, a full tank of gas, you know, five, 450, 500 mile road trip in a car is, you know, how much fuel it takes. That's just for, for one body. And, you know, there are other disposition methods that are coming, um, you know, into awareness and into practice. One is the aquamation, which maybe you have heard of before. It's legal here in Oregon. And so that is, or it's also called um, alkaline hydrolysis. And so um, it's being dissolved in water and, you know, in a highly high alkaline uh, solution that is, um, you know, whatever is added to that water so that it's inert enough that it can be released into, you know, city water um, supply after it's done. And basically everything dissolves except the bones. Um, and then they're uh, pulverized just like they are in fire cremation. So in both water cremation and fire cremation, whatever is left is uh, basically put into like kind of a giant coffee grinder. And um, the, the, the water cremation cremains are uh, more like fluffy white, like kind of powdery sugary, not the gray um, chunky stuff from fire cremation. And then we're just a couple of weeks into um, being having the legal option here in Oregon of being composted. Um, and so we're the third state, it was Washington, Colorado, and then Oregon. And so that um, similar to water cremation, it's, you know, the body is placed in a, a large vessel. Um, there's no, no energy um, input. The body is put into this large um, kind of cylinder with a ton of, not literal ton, but a bunch of wood chips and, the, and alfalfa and straw. And within, um, you know, I think they say it's recomposed, the company that's currently doing it up in Washington, I think they say like within three to four weeks, it's perfectly usable garden soil. I mean, everything, everything those microbes broke down everything, even teeth. Um, I find that so amazing. Um, so I think, you know, it takes a, a longer underground, you know, it's not a controlled process like it is, um, you know, when we're doing it in these cylinders and they're controlling the airflow and the temperature and all of those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, so that's a thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, grew out of an, a need for alternatives in urban settings. You know, here in our region of Southern Oregon, we've got a lot of land <laughs> and there's, uh, I think, plenty of places to, to be buried and to protect land by, you know, it being used for burial and to still use those burial areas as, um, you know, for other, other life activities, um, which is a bit of a change of culture, I think, of how um, some people hold the idea of a cemetery, but it's an option. I just wanted to share this guide and it might be on the resources that um, Carrie put together for all of us. Um, and I encourage you to check those out. There's some really great um, pieces put together on you know, green burial, but also end of life options and planning. And so this is a guide and you can go on the website for this resource guide and even just um, you know, purchase just your state so you don't need the whole guide or you don't need, you know, every state. So I encourage you to check that out. And also, you know, if you or someone you're in touch with is living somewhere and they're just not sure where green burial is an option, um, there's visiting the Green Burial Council's website where they have a listing of places that they've certified. Um, excuse me, but there are a lot of places to have a, a natural or green burial that aren't certified. And so I always encourage folks to just approach the, your, your neighborhood cemeteries and ask them. Um, and if they haven't had green burials yet, but they know that you're interested and maybe a handful of other people that you know are interested, um, you know, they might be in, open to allowing it or possibly even to setting aside an area. And I know that we have, um, you know, someone on the call who has done a lot of work with approaching cemeteries and asking them and, you know, it can be, a, it might be something that they're open to. So I just encourage people to ask. 
And then, of course, if you are, you know, in a place where a private land burial is an option for you, so this means that you live outside of city limits, and there's no, no requirement on the size of your property, um, there are some requirements in terms of, like I said, being away from a waterway and things like that. But private land burial is a pretty, um, pretty doable and straightforward process for us here in Southern Oregon. Um, just, you know, some permitting with the planning department and a small fee, um, but not that, not that uh, cumbersome of a process. So if you want to know more about that, um, I'm happy to um, answer more questions about that or give you some resources. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about containers and shrouds. And you can see from the photos here, these are both burials at the forest um, with us. And so in the upper right, um, this woman is wrapped in a shroud that her friends uh, crocheted in her final days of life. Because they're, if you've been with someone in their final days, you know that sometimes there's a lot of uh, just being present and uh, sitting around. And so while they were doing that with her, they were also very busily crocheting. And so, um, so they chose a shroud. And then the center photo down at the bottom there, um, this family chose a, a pine um, casket that they purchased from the local funeral home. And this is um, you know, certified as kosher. So anything that's certified as kosher would you know, be appropriate for green burial. Um, we're also really blessed here in the valley that we have arc wood caskets. Um, right out of Phoenix. So really simple, really beautiful, unfinished pine um, caskets that are work really well. And I, I always point out to folks that, you know, um, at least if you're in a natural burial ground, and a lot of conventional cemeteries will allow shrouds as well, but a shroud can be as simple as some old sheets. Um, it doesn't need to be anything fancy um, or purchased necessarily. And at the same time, there are lovely, beautiful silk shrouds um, that you can um, make or purchase. And um, the funeral home here in Ashland, Litwiller Simonson, they have a, a nice display room if you get a chance to visit them ever. And you know they're open during business hours and you can just ask to look at their products, but they have the silk shrouds, they have um, a couple of different casket options. Um, we do encourage folks to seek, you know, regional resources for their shroud or container. Like any other industry, you know, the green burial is a, is a bit of an industry. And so you can order, you know, a lovely wicker or bamboo casket that is made on the other side of the planet. Um, but there are greener options, right? And we live in a place with um, lots of options. So, and then there's something that I love to um, talk about that's called Shelves for Life. And uh, this is a guy um, from the UK who you email your height and weight, and he emails you back the plans for designing these shelves for life, which construct into a bookshelf while you're enjoying life and then deconstruct and reconstruct into your casket when you are ready for that. So um, it's, you know, being purposeful and efficient with, <laughs> with the things that you have around you. And, you know, looking again for uh, Green Burial Council certified products is one way to ensure that what you're purchasing um, has met some quality uh, standards. And you can look on the Green Burial Council's website for a, a list of products that they've certified there as well. Marianne, there's a question in the chat. Oh, um, thank you. I, it didn't pop up for me. I'm sorry about oh, that. Oh, you're good. Um, they asked, can you use a mushroom shroud? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And um, they actually have those mushroom suits on display at the Littwiller Simonson Funeral Home too. So what it is, is it's a muslin shroud that has been from what I have seen and maybe um, there are other options out there but it's been uh, uh, mushroom spores have been put into it and so that is definitely an option where we are the forest is full of 
mushrooms and mycelium under the earth. So, um, you know, what the owners have told me that they think would happen, because I don't know where the mushroom suit uh, spores are from, is that um, our, our mycelium would probably just eat those ones for breakfast. So um, there's a lot of, of uh, already, you know, in the soil where we are, it's a healthy forest that has been well taken care of. Um, so while yes, you could choose that, um, I'm not sure that the mushrooms in that particular shroud are going to change the rate of decomposition or um, that kind of thing. But yeah, it, it would meet the green burial uh, criteria. Thanks for that question. Um, so this is the the forest conservation burial ground. We're looking um, we're looking uh, kind of north here uh, on the Willow Whit Ranch property, which is 445 acres, and the burial ground itself is currently um, just over 18, but we're expanding closer to 40. This great entryway meadow that you um, see here in the photo um, has been a federally protected wetland for the last maybe um, almost 10 years. And with um, you know, our rapidly changing climate is not, not really qualifying as the wetland that it once did. So. Um, a fair bit of this has converted to dry land plants. So we've decided to expand the burial ground and open up part of that, um, that meadow. And so what you see right here in the foreground, you can see a couple of stones on the ground. And so these were stones that were um, pulled out of the grave that's right there in the center. Um, this was our second burial last summer. Actually it was, um, yeah, so the burial was in the summer and then the photo, of course, you see a little bit of snow there. So it was a little later in the year. And here are just a couple other uh, photos of kind of what burial looks like. Um, and these are um, the Vista spots. I will say that most of the other plots in the forest are in, um, you know, not at the edge of this meadow, but are up in the forested area. So we, we leave the soil in place. Um, we hand dig the graves. And so we are able to remove the soil in the layers that it exists in naturally. So we're really careful about setting aside the topsoil and then setting aside on a different tarp, the subsoil. And then eventually um, we hit just a whole lot of clay soil. And so we put that on a tarp and then we cover them in um, evergreen boughs. And we also line the bottom of the grave in evergreen boughs. And there's um, are a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's beautiful and it you know helps the families see a soft landing for their loved one. But also we are adding in some more organic matter and creating some air pockets around that body so that as we put the soil in, those branches um, are gonna leave some air pockets that are gonna aid the decomposition. Um, and then, you know, we invite families, which a lot of other natural burial grounds do as well, to, to participate in as much of the process of the burial as they want. And that can be from, you know, of course, from choosing the plot for sure, but also of digging the grave, of carrying their loved one to the grave site, of lowering their loved one's body, and then of helping us um, to close the grave. And you know, there's there's a lot of folks in the death care industry that talk about how, you know, physically doing something with our own bodies can really be a helpful way to process our own grief around the death. Um, one, one quote from a man named Thomas Lynch is that, you know, grief is best processed with our large muscles. Um, so just the act of doing something. And for some families, you know, you know, I think even just the act of witnessing us doing the work is helpful for them. Um, we are blessed with a team of uh, strong ranch staff who um, over the last year have doubled their duties as uh, and turned into grave diggers as well. So we're happy to do it and we're happy for families to help if that is um, 
of interest. And, you know, like I said, with green burial, because the soil is there, the earth is there, um, there's something about, you know, really not being able to deny what's really happening. You know, there's just some kind of realness to um, the green burial experience that feels different to me in my experience than a conventional burial where, you know, the earth is sometimes covered. Often, you know, folks don't see the lowering of the casket um, and often for liability reasons are not able to stay for the closing of the grave because it's often, um, you know, a large machinery type of um, event. So that's how we do it up at the forest, um, all with shovels and rock bars and all of that. And then just an overview picture of the ranch, of Willow Whit Ranch. And you can see this is a beautiful, clear day. Um, Pilot Rock is off in the distance there and Mount Shasta. And then down in the center of the photo, um, you can see the farm and the ranch house and the burial ground is um, just off to the right in the photo. Most, most of it is uh, forested. I'll just pause here for a second just to see if there are any questions about um, just kind of the basics of green burial or about the forest itself. So we actually just had one uh, come in the chat. <clears throat> um, so let's see. They ask, can you diagram the process from the time you die until you are actually in the ground? Who does what and when? Can you prepay? Um, then they say, I've executed a pre-arrangement with Elizabeth at Cornerstone Funeral Service. Ooh. It doesn't include burial or burial plot. Uh, I was looking at Harold in Washington State, and it turns out that interstate burials are more complicated. <laughs> um, and then explain the endowment. So they, um, there's yeah. several questions there. but Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll start with the endowment piece, actually. So... Um, we are an endowment care cemetery. So that means that 15% of the plot purchase is invested in a fund with the state. And we are able to withdraw interest from that fund over the years to help us cover you know, maintenance and operations costs. And at a place like the forest where we're not um, spending our time mowing lawns, the maintenance costs are really, you know, taking care of the health of the forest. So taking out, you know, diseased trees and, you know, processing them. Also, um, Willow Whit Ranch is up Shale City Road, which is uh, most of which is on BLM land, but the ranch takes care of the winter access. So we plow that road in the winter all the way up to our driveway. So keeping that access and then maintaining our perimeter fencing. If any of you have uh, owned rural land and taken care of fencing, you know that that is a thing. And so we have all 445 acres fenced and that is really to keep out the free range uh, cattle that graze on BLM land in the summer. It doesn't take long for a, a herd of cattle to destroy a wetland as you can imagine. So um, it's, yeah, we're pretty serious about keeping them out. Um, the prepay question, you can prepay. And um, there's for, at the forest, there's a small discount for prepaying, um, you know, instead of at need, of course. And then we do have a couple of payment plan options um, for folks. And when you purchase, um, there are kind of two separate uh things that you're purchasing. So one is the physical plot, which is your interment right, the right to be buried in that physical plot on the land. And then the other is the labor, the opening and closing of the grave and a recording fee, so kind of a paperwork fee. And those also can be paid in advance, but we invest 90% of that in a fund also with the state in your name. So those funds stay in your name and you can take that money back with the interest at any point without penalty. Um, it's really kind of a consumer protection so that when your time comes and we need to pay someone to dig the grave, those funds have been safe and protected and are available. And so we have to submit a proof of death in order to get those funds um, transferred to us. So, um, and then the process of, you know, how to arrange a green burial. I'm interested to hear that the 
who, you know, I don't know who wrote that question, but the, the interstate piece uh, was complicated. We were, um, you know, our first burial, the gentleman was flown here from Florida. Um, he was an Oregonian from this area and wanted, his family wanted his body returned here. Um, and so it wasn't complicated um, for that particular family, but it did require the involvement of funeral homes and, you know, on both ends of that process. And so, you know, the circumstances of someone's death are quite varied. And so um, I'll give kind of, you know, the most typical that um, we have experienced so far in terms of the process. So, you know, it's uh, pretty common that folks die at home on hospice or in the hospital. And then, you know, the family, um, when they're ready, often calls the funeral home to come and pick up the body. And the funeral home usually keeps the body, you know, in refrigeration until the service. And they also um, can do the shrouding and the, the ca or the casketing of the body. And then we coordinate with the family and the funeral home around timing and what's gonna be best. And then the funeral home um, handles transportation up to the ranch. And I think that's a pretty um, common uh, progression for a lot of folks. There are lots of alternatives within that. I think the greatest one being that there's no requirement whatsoever that we hire a funeral home or anyone else to handle after death care for our loved ones. So we're pretty lucky here in Oregon. We have lots of rights and our loved ones bodies um you know after death become personal property and they belong to the next of kin so whether someone has died you know whether they're at the coroner's offices coroner, coroner's office or at the hospital or they've died at home that body it can be in the rightful possession of you know their family and there are ways i'll talk a little bit about you know ways of doing that um of caring for our own loved ones at home after death. Um, but then, you know, as long as the right permitting and things like that are done, you know, we can handle our own transportation, we can file our own death certificate, all of those things. Um, you know, it does take some knowing and following the system and the steps. Basically, up at the up at the burial ground, the day of the burial, we just need to receive this certain permit and see the little metal ID tag that the state issues that is buried with the body. And we can see that from anyone. We can see that from a funeral director. We can see that from the family, whoever has taken care of it. So it doesn't it doesn't really change things on our end um, as long as the proper paperwork has been taken care of. And feel free to write any other question around there if that doesn't feel complete. Thank you for that. Um, there is another question. How far ahead of time can um, someone choose their plot? Yeah, so, you know, folks are, there's, there's really no uh, limit on that. So folks can choose, you know, at any point. Um, we do, when we do a contract, we do have to sell a specific plot. And so for folks that, um, you know, don't come up to the ranch, we choose that. Um, but, you know, most, mostly folks have come up, you know, for a tour, looked around, found the right spot for them. And then we complete the contract and the paperwork um, at that time. But yeah, there's no uh, no limit to or no, yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So because my um, my entry really into end of you know after death care came as a home funeral guide, um, almost yeah, almost six years ago now, I guess I um, trained down in California with um, a woman named Jerry Grace Lyons, who's kind of considered one of the really the, the matriarchs of the home funeral movement. And, you know, just like green burial, home funeral is not new. I didn't invent it. Again, it's really the way that most families, uh, you know, cared for their loved ones, especially, you know, pre-Civil War. Um, and, and even, you know, well after that there, I, I meet people now and again who do have memories growing up of, you know, grandma being, you know, literally, in the living room laying in honor. And that's the whole idea, you know, of the, the parlor, you know. Um, so I think that um, 
home funerals and green burials do have, you know, a, a, a natural sort of tie in to each other. Um, there's a DIY element to the home funeral. And, and it, again, especially here in Oregon, it's very possible and it's, um, you know, supported by our laws and all of that. So it's completely legal um, to keep our loved ones at home and for the family to lead all parts of whatever it is that they want to create in honor of their loved one. There's also this, you know, eco-conscious, because if we're having a home funeral, um, typically that means that it's, you know, uh, the body has not been embalmed, that we're using more natural materials. This uh, container that these little kids are decorating is a heavy duty cardboard. It's actually what uh, funeral homes use for cremation if the family doesn't want to purchase some other um, casket, you know, to be burned. And so it's this heavy duty uh, cardboard that can be, you know, lovingly decorated. And, you know, a home funeral can range from a day to up to several days. And um, I would say that three days is kind of the probably most common, the norm for folks that want to keep their loved one at home. And, you know, that can be a time of ceremony, of ritual, of gatherings, um, but also a time to take care of the practical things of, you know, filing the paperwork and uh, doing that. A lot more cost conscious, um, you know, because you're not paying for um, a lot of the services that a funeral home charges. And, you know, with with funeral homes, they, they have just kind of a base fee um, that, you know, a basic package that you have to pay, even if you don't necessarily want all the things or you just want this or that. Um, it, it can be difficult to really um, to, you know, get out of a funeral home without a couple thousand dollars um, being paid for whatever. And then, of course, there's, you know, an opportunity, not that conventional funerals aren't meaningful, but in a home funeral, I would say that um, I found that everything slows down a little bit and families are really able to do everything on their own time and their own rhythm. Um, you know, we don't have to be anywhere at noon. Um, there's no emergency. There's no, um, yeah, just no sense of urgency. And there are, um, you know, ways to, to go about the home funeral that, um, you know, make the, make it the best of it. And I just want to see, um, oh, there we go. That's what I was hoping to go to. Um, so a home funeral can include, you know, bathing the body, um, you know, laying them out. So, so dressing them or wrapping them in a shroud or blankets, whatever, um, having a home vigil time. So sometimes, like I said, that could be a day or a couple days, planning your own ceremony, filing your own paperwork, handling your own transportation, and then making the disposition arrangements, whether that's for private land burial, cremation, or burial in, you know, in a conventional or a, a green cemetery. So it could be one of these things or all of these things. Um, it's really kind of a tailoring it to whatever suits you and your family. These are some wonderful resources that I encourage you to check out. I mentioned the Green Burial Council already, but the National Home Funeral Alliance is, again, just a, you know, they have more information on their website, even, you know, sort of beyond home funerals, you know, end of life planning documents, questions to be asking yourselves, conversations to be having with your loved ones. And they have, you know, different guides and resources to sort of guide you through that process. Um, videos of other people's home funerals, lots of photos to see what different shrouds look like, what different containers look like, um, all kinds of great stuff on there. And then this book, Final Rites, um, is put out by um, two of the founders of the Funeral Consumers Alliance, which is really an advocacy um, education organization helping make sure that consumers um, are treated fairly in the funeral industry. And they've produced Final Rites, which um, they've revised since the first edition. And so it goes state by state and lists all of um, our rights and laws around after death care and funerals. And again, you can download from their website just your just the states that you want the information for. So I, I think that that is a helpful resource for folks that want that.
And then I'm really excited to be sharing this resource with you, um, organfuneral.org. This is um, a wonderful place to check out that was um, put together um, in part by a woman named Holly Pruitt. She um, is a big death educator and advocate um, in the Portland area. And she worked with um, a man named, named David Noble who ran Riverview Cemetery, which is a big old beautiful cemetery um, in Portland for you know 20 something years he was uh, there. And so this is like all this, all kinds of information and all the steps if you do wanna do any part of your own planning or your own in-home after death care. I mean, they have photos of all the forms and how to do it and where to go. Um, and, you know, they keep this updated and it really is, um, you know, they've researched the laws and all of that. So a really wonderful resource that I think currently exists for Washington state and New Hampshire, um, but they're working for, you know, to create a version for um, every state eventually. So that's organfuneral.org. And um, I'll just share my contact information with you. And um, please, yeah, you're welcome to, to give a call or send an email or be in touch. Like I said, the burial ground and Willowit Ranch itself is uh, open to the public every day. The burial ground is dawn to dusk and there um, are some trails there that you can hike. And the farm, if you head up to the farm proper, that's 11 to five. Um, every day. And, you know, it's, there's a whole farm store with eggs and like I said, the goat milk and fresh veggies. And I think for a few more weeks, we'll have our baby goats before they go on to their next homes and our chickens and our geese and our guard dogs. And, um, you know, it's a whole barnyard scene <laughs> and lots of picnic tables for you and your family to have picnics and um, you know, it's a wonderful place to sort of bring the whole family up. Um, and yeah, so I encourage you all to visit sometime. And if you um, want to come up for a, a guided tour of the burial ground, um, you can register for that on our website. And we do, you know, a couple uh, group tours every month through October. And then, of course, um, are willing to schedule private tours also. And so I, I welcome uh, your questions. We have another question in the chat. Um, who or what is used to transport the body to the burial plot? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, we do have um, through the area, there's about four acres of the burial ground that is currently open for burials that we've had surveyed so far. Um, and that has a, uh, it's an old uh, skid road from when the area was um, logged, you know, a long time ago. And so that is, um, parts of that are accessible with the hearse. So we've had the funeral director back into some areas, um, but there is some carrying involved. And so we have a beautiful pine uh, wood from pine from the ranch, um, like a, a litter, um, you know, for carrying the body, the shrouded body or the casketed body. And again, we invite the family to help with that or um, our ranch staff can definitely help with that. And often the funeral directors themselves have helped as well. Um, so yeah, so there is some carrying involved and, you know, it's, it's a forest, so it's uneven ground and, you know, we move the big sticks out of the way, but it's, um, you know, we're not picking up all the sticks or anything like that. So um, it's definitely a, a process. Yeah. And I just was uh, showing, here's the, the flyer with where you can uh, register for a tour if you were interested in coming up. And again, you're more than welcome to come up just on your own um, anytime really and, and visit. And we have some information um, you know, in a, a sign holder there at the burial ground where you can do your own self-guided adventure for sure. And yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us and um, for being again, open to exploring this and approaching this part of our reality as humans. It's our, our time is not forever. And so um, I'm sure that your loved ones will be grateful to you for uh, putting some thought and time into what's important to you. So thank you for that. 
And again, I want to say thank you to the library system and to you, Carrie, for your support in um, creating this offering. Well, thank you, Marianne. I, I'm actually now thinking I want to go up there and, and take one of the, the tours um, because it looks like a, a beautiful place to, to have your final resting place. So, mm -hmm. so thank you for the service you provide and for educating us on, on the options available. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. All right, well, with that, we will see you all later. Have a wonderful day. Stay cool and drink plenty of water. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> yeah. Bye, take Bye. care.